Okay, <clears throat> this should be okay. Hopefully, everyone can see this and everyone can hear me. But um, uh, thanks a lot, Patrick, for that uh, introduction. Um, and thanks a lot, Satsports, for having this uh, this webinar series. Um, the speakers before me have been outstanding, and I'm sure a lot of people have got some great information um, from those last few speakers. Um, and I guess most importantly, thanks thanks to everyone um, for holding out and uh, and for waiting for the for the last speaker for myself. Um, hopefully, I can provide an insight into how we use GPS within Kobe and um, how how effective it is for us. So this is just a, a general overview of what we uh, what we're looking at today. So what, how, and uh, why we use GPS? Uh, the KPIs we select: integration, periodization, feedback loops, uh, and motivation within the squad. So it's uh, looking at the the uses uh, from a, a broad point of view, um, not delving in too deep into into any one particular field. So as as Pat said, uh, my background. Um, I suppose I started with the Chiefs in 2013 um, and I was lucky enough to be part of a, a Super 15 winning uh, championship team straight away. So uh, I got to work under Dave Rennie, uh, who's soon to be the Australian head coach. And Wayne Smith was one of the assistant coaches who's got 20, 20 plus years in the All Blacks. So I was really lucky from, from that perspective with a great performance team. Uh, with a uh, notable mention to, to Brett Smith, the sports scientist there, uh, and it was, it was it was a great great learning curve for me, great experience for me. So I ended up I'll have to correct you there, Pat. I ended up three years in the Chiefs, um, came back, uh, finished off my degrees, and um, I ended up in in Munster rugby. So uh, Munster as well. For any of you who don't know the academy systems in Ireland, um, they're predominantly 17, 18 year old um, athletes all the way to 22, 23. So it's a four year cycle. And it's a really successful program that is in each of the provinces. Um, and you'll see that just if you see any interpro game between um, Munster and Leinster, for example, pr the predominant um, bulk of the squads are, are academy based players. So they have been very successful to date. And again, that was a great learning curve for me uh, because when you're in an academy, you don't just focus on GPS. You have your strength and conditioning, the traditional strength and conditioning side of things. You've got your return to play. You've got your one-on-one -on -one with players, coaches. So it's a really, uh, really great for, for overall development. And lastly, I suppose I'm in, I'm in Kobe now with Kobelco Steelers in Japan. Uh, we are the current... Top league champions and top league cup champions, um, and I've been there since uh, 2019. So the the link really is between the Chiefs and Kobe. So in 2014 they created a um, a partnership, and Wayne Smith, who was with me in the in Chiefs, is now the the Kontoku or the the head of uh, Kobelco Steelers Rugby. So he's the director of rugby there. So he contacted me, asked me would I be interested and. Yeah, I jumped at the opportunity to to get involved and grow the game, grow the game in Japan. <clears throat> so that's where I am presently, and obviously our, our season's cut short, but uh, we were trending to. Uh, we'd like to think for another top league, and and hopefully we get the chance to to, to do that in the near future. Now, uh, I would imagine that not a lot of people know a lot about Japanese rugby or, or possibly about the culture. So I'll just give you a quick background into that before we go any further. So, firstly, from a cultural standpoint, uh, the Japanese are a very, very hardworking um, people. And I know that's, a, that's quite a broad statement, but um, when they commit to something, they are 100% committed. They, they, they almost don't appreciate a down day, so they work and they just want to work again. Um, and it's, it's, there are positives to it. There are negatives, but there are also um, huge positives because... I suppose there's there's a willingness to grow, a willingness to get better um, at each task that they're that they've been asked to do. So there's a huge positive to that from a cultural point of view. Uh, each one of our each one of the rugby teams is governed by by a um, by a company. So you might be familiar with Panasonic, Toyota, Toshiba. All of these are, are rugby clubs within Japan, and obviously ourselves are our Kobelco Steel Group. Um, so 70 or 80% of our, between 70 and 80% of our players actually 
work for the company. So we're a semi-professional league. Um, so obviously with that, you'd have 70 or 80 percent of our players are Japanese speaking only. And for us to communicate, to schedule around around work, we have um, we have to have huge transparency on, on our plans and what, what we're looking to do with the players. Again, in terms of the Japanese rugby as a whole, with the exploits of the national team in 2015 uh, and again just recently, uh, last year in the World Cup and with them hosting the World Cup there's been a huge uh, boom and huge growth in, in, in rugby in Japan. So it's an extremely exciting time to be in Japan and just a, a few examples of that are the university final that, that took place this year at the rugby final there was a, there was a, a max there was an attendance of 60,000 people at the game. Uh, on average our, our games attracts 20,000 uh, 20, people um, uh, spectators which is a record for for Japanese rugby so it's growing um, from a coaching point of view obviously as I've, I've mentioned already we've you've got the likes of Wayne Smith you've got Jamie Joseph over the national team Eddie Jones spent some time in Japan uh, Tony Brown so all of these guys are, are top class coaches and have, have won at the at the top level as well and then also from a playing point of view so we have I suppose to drop a few names, we've got a few big names in our in our club. We've got Dan Carter, Andy Ellis, Brody Retallick. So all these guys uh, who've won World Cups or multiple World Cups. And then throughout the other squads, you, you get to bump into the likes of David Pocock, Sam Whitelock, um, Kieran Reid. So again, all of these are are pretty much legends of the, of the, of the game, of, the, of, of rugby. And... The combination of the culture, the mentality of the Japanese people, along with that expertise in coaching, that class of players, really, um, really, it, it, it buys in or it ties into uh, the, the Japanese rugby just growing and growing and, and essentially hopefully becoming a professional league and, and progressing on on the world stage. So I suppose bottom line here is just an extremely exciting time to be in Japan and I'm, I'm pretty privileged to be part of it. Okay, what are we looking at today? So we're looking at um, our how do we measure our workload within rugby and how do we use that information to, to speak to the coaches. So um, we use it from a planning point of view. So planning our, our years, our seasons, our weeks and our, our days. Use it from a motivational point of view for the athletes, for our performance staff and also our coaches and from a relationships point of view. So how, how we actually integrate that. That GBS into the into the whole system, um, and then why would we do it? I suppose essentially we want to be the champions of Japan again. We want to dominate the top league and, and be relentless in in how we play and how we how we physically approach games as well, so uh, that other teams cannot live with us um, during game time. So the physical component for us is, is extremely important. So that's the overall goal to to add and to have impact on the physical side of. Uh, on winning, on winning another title. So just before we get into this, I just want to, um, I just want to you to have a look at our our style of play, our, our philosophy. So we sit down with the coaches and they explain what their philosophy was. So they wanted to be this relentless team who in attack. They wanted to be really a high energy, high paced. Um, on attack and defense and they wanted a, a number of people and working very very hard off the, off the ball and you'll notice that in this clip here if i just play it through and you can have you can just watch it so it ties into the nature of rugby as well as that intermittent um sport where it's extremely um physical a lot of work on off the ball a lot of work on the ball and it's a very high skilled uh, a game we play an expansive game so it's high risk and high reward as well so that's just a, a, a just a snippet of, of, of way of the way we like to play and it's philosophy of, of our coaches so it's quite important to know what your coaches are looking for and once you have an understanding of what they're seeing and what they're looking for then you can start to build a picture of what kpis you're going to use what metrics you're going to look at and, and it makes the process a small bit easier and it begins that, that integration early in, in the piece. So if we look at 
um, KPIs that have been traditionally used in uh, in in rugby and and in other team sports. There's been distance, high speed running, accelerations, decelerations, and again, there's a, there's a lot more I could go into, but these are these are four that that often um, come up in terms of uh, KPI selection. Now, if we take them individually and we just uh, Relate them to what we want to do on pitch and and rugby as a as a sport. We uh, we start to understand them and how they relate to us. So I'm going to give just two examples here. So A is a rugby example where we've got an athlete. It's a rugby specific example. So it's that intermittent um, sport. So it's that intermittent session where your athlete is starting at these set of cones, he's sprinting 20 meters, turning um, and accelerating back out. And he's going to do that 10 times, so 20 meters, 10 times. Um, in a different session, that athlete's going to start just at the start line. He's going to run 200 meters all the way around to the finish line. So obviously, total distance in both of these is 200 meters. So the, the makeup of that 200 meters is very different. We don't, if, if you just take total distance on its own as the KPI, you're not getting a true idea or a true indication of how they're actually achieving that 200 meters so so um just a good story from this is in the chiefs we had a prop who um to be politically correct he he cost us a few points so he was missing in um the defensive line he might have been missing in the attack structure or support lines um but he often had one of the highest total distances in the squad. So he was similar to B where he was holding that one pace all the way through to, that, um, to the finish line. So he was able to get big distances, but they weren't actually um, affecting the game. Um, so what we would rather see is being able to have that change of pace, that, that, uh, that burst in acceleration, the burst in deceleration, that really suit the, the game of rugby as a whole. So oh, if you look at um, gain A, high speed running, uh, the amount of high speed running in this example is very low. So you might get your athlete uh, to cover a couple of meters in the middle after his, decel after, after his acceleration and leading into his deceleration. So it's a very low amount of high speed running. Whereas in option B, you're going to get a huge amount. So outside of the ex initial acceleration, he's going to hold a high speed running event all the way through to the finish line so there's a clear difference and in rugby you don't tend to see a huge amount of high speed running so again are we going to use it as a, a KPI um, and as a, one of our main metrics on its own yeah there, there's an argument that you, that you probably wouldn't the last thing then I just want to speak about is our accelerations and decelerations so again in this uh, intermittent activity you're going to get a huge amount of accelerations and decelerations um, but on the other hand, you're only going to get one acceleration here, which will lead you into your high speed running uh, and you're not going to get any deceleration. So for me, it's not, probably not, um, but probably again, if we're looking at the makeup of our KPIs, distance, I think is, is out of the question. Uh, high speed running has a small bit of merit, but your accelerations and decelerations seem to be um, what we're what we're after in terms of a measurement of workload or work done in a game or a training session. So, high speed running as well. So, um, similar to an earlier presentation, I've just broken up the uh, a graph into uh, activity graph of, of our first half or one of our players. So, on the bottom, you've got time. And uh, or on the x-axis you've got time, and on the y-axis you have speed in meters per second. So in our green zone here, you have your aerobic running, um, yellow your anaerobic, and then your reds are your high-speed running events. So just bear in mind and just have a quick look at it. There's actually not a huge amount of high-speed running events in this game. Now this is for um, one of our inside backs in the first half of first game of the season. So. Um, this is real data. So again, you're not getting that huge amount of high speed running. So it, it fits in with what we saw in A, where there's only small segments of high, of high speed running. Um, and it's just worth noting as well that often, like B, uh, leading into that high speed running, there's often an acceleration. So 
again, if we're talking about measuring workload, are we getting a huge amount by just looking at the, the red peaks or do we need to know what's happened? So just an example of this is again, um, if you look at our 11, he's going to catch the ball now. He's going to accelerate, hold a high speed and finish off the try. So uh, I suppose the point I'm getting at is what precedes that high speed running? What, um, how do you, how do they get up to that, um, that event? And again, you're looking at something that doesn't happen too often in a game where there's a breakaway from the 22 to score a try. Um, you might have an example where there's you're chasing down a, a kick or, or chasing a, a try saving tackle. So there are only a, a few instances, instances in a game where you'll get true high speed running. So that's you just need to be aware of that when you're talking about the specific KPIs. So we're a bit happier with our accelerations and decelerations, and how does that look on the same activity graph? So again, you're looking at your accelerations in your green and your decelerations in your, your orange. So that's just a just to highlight what we're looking at. And again, just visually, you don't need any numbers, just visually you're seeing a lot more accelerations and a lot more decelerations than you did the, the high speed running. So and is it a good metric for, for measuring overall? You'd already think that it's probably going to give you a small bit, uh, a small bit more than the high speed running itself. And how, what does that look like in terms of our rugby? So look at the English defence, they're accelerating off the line, they're decelerating, and then they're um, accelerating to make a decision. They accelerate back into line for the second phase, and they accelerate off the line. So that's essentially uh, part of how we like to play as well, where we're overwhelming in our defence, and uh, we put maximum line speed and maximum pressure on the attack and really put their skills under pressure. So again, is it applicable to rugby? Yes, it 100% is. And throughout all phase play, um, you'll see those high bursts of accelerations and decelerations. So essentially what we're looking for is an acceleration, a deceleration, and a high-speed running event combined into one metric. And lucky enough, that's sports have this in, in uh, their high metabolic load. So high metabolic load here is, is in purple. And you can see that it, it follows, the, follows the, the signal or the activity graph itself. So it gives, a, it gives a true representation of the accelerations, decelerations, and high speed running. So again, for us, it gives a true representation of how we want to play, uh, our philosophy, and it's going to give us a true measure and a good measure of the overall workload done. And we just call it high mets as well um, within the club, uh, and we'll get into that a small bit further down the line in the presentation. But I think uh, hopefully you get an, an overview of, of, of why we chose high mets as our, um, as our KPI and why we didn't look at just um, high speed running on its own or, or acceleration, decelerations on its own, because uh, we just believe that they're not mutually exclusive. They, they, they interact together. So we have our KPI. We're quite happy that it fits our philosophy and we're quite happy that we can measure it. How do we integrate it? For me, again, GPS is such a complex um, system like, and we need to be able to keep it simple. So uh, our attention, essentially, it's a, it's a limited resource. So we need to be able to... Um, we can only really uh, concentrate on one thing at a time. So we can't have a huge amount of metrics going back to the players or the coaches or even the performance staff because they, they won't buy into the system uh, straight away if you, if you confuse them with too much. I suppose we've got three rules that we stick to when we keep it simple, and that's face validity, so what, I, what I just spoke about. So for me, face validity is the coaches have to be able to understand what you're talking about. The players also have to be able to understand what you're talking about. And it has to relate to um, their outputs in a game. And they have to see that link. Without that link, you won't get the buy-in. And your whole GPS system will be just something that will be on the side. Uh, it won't be fully integrated in the team. You also have to know the GPS limitations. So everything that I've just spoken about so far is in terms of uh, uh, locomotion. So... It doesn't take into account the other physical demands of rugby. So our collisions, our scrums, our contact work. So again, you have to know its limitations before you um, before you give feedback or 
you have to be aware of those limitations when you're giving feedback. And then lastly, the visual representation. So it's, it's quite important for us to, to be um, pretty on point with our, with our representation of data because I guess with in and around that 80% of our staff and our players being um, uh, native Japanese speakers, um, and without with my Japanese not being so good, uh, we we uh, we need to be we need to have a, a pretty robust and pretty simple system to to be able to to speak to these um, to coaches and to the players. So again, something that we just use and you'll see it throughout the presentation is just a traffic light system, green being light, uh, yellow being uh, moderate, and red being hard, and that will uh, represent a drill, a session, a week, uh, all in terms of that high metabolic load. And then once you have all those, um, you've got you've got that uh, that simplicity, and you're building that integration within the team. And I guess just a nice quote that I, I came across was "language encodes culture." So you'll see a lot of teams will have uh, language around their attack. They'll have personal or, or team language around their defence and around their mini groups within their teams. So for us, we want to that to be the same with our GPS and our, our sports science or our SNC um, side of things. So um, again, that's that's why we use the term high Mets and like just a few examples of that again, or we'll have a lot of coaches come to, to me and they'll say, um, what were our high Mets in that trail? What were our high Mets in that session? And what high Mets are we looking for, for example? And again, just a, a nice little story um, to, to highlight highlight this is this is just context of this video we were 30 points up with two minutes to go and uh, Kubota scored a try so this Navy team scored a try and the player was just about to kick the conversion and you'll see that we had about 10 of our guys accelerate really hard off the off the line so my question after the game was what were you thinking um, <laughs> we had won the game you're putting yourself at risk of doing a hammy or, or picking up a soft tissue injury. And their response was just simply, we were getting our high Mets up. So again, it just gives that, um, that appreciation that the language that we use around our GPS, uh, it's ingrained in our culture. It's ingrained in our, in our D in the DNA of our club uh, and the players know what we're talking about and the coaches also know what we're talking about. So um, I think that's just really important to get the system up and running and to get get, uh, get the information off the ground. From uh, We'll just move on again. So how do we use that data then? So part of how we use it was planning and, and periodization. So I just want to just um, speak really quickly about just something that we can consider for our periodization model. So, Typically, if we've got a Saturday game, we have a gym on Monday, a gym on Tuesday, and a gym on Thursday. So it's three gyms a week. Uh, we've got a recovery day on that Wednesday, but we usually have those five on-feed sessions a week as well. So we come light on Monday, we'll have a Tuesday, we'll have a double session Thursday, a captain's run on Friday, and a game on a Saturday. So without, without looking into the science of it, you already can see that... Um, the biggest impact that's going that we're going to have on a game on the weekend is our on-feed sessions. Um, so, I guess the question that I put to the floor is: in traditional S and C, we're unbelievably good at um, at gym programming. I'm talking about the S and C community here. So we'll go from like sets, reps, time under tension, all the way down to um, the percentages that we're uh, um, of speed we're going to lift the bar at. So we're brilliant at that. But I suppose the question is, do we give as much considerations to, um, to the on-feed periodization and the loading each week and, and, and throughout the season? And it's just a thought, um, and it's just something that we've really honed in on and really uh, we really tried to attack over the last few years and through those chief, Chiefs years as well. So why would we periodize? And what's the argument for periodize? So if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Um, if you don't have that end point that you're working towards, then how do you know how to get there? Um, so you need that plan. And without it, we'd essentially be just working week to week and living week to week, putting out fires, which we don't want to do. So <clears throat> if you draw your attention here to the, the y-axis, you're looking at the hypothetical fitness injuries and performance of, a, of your team. 
And then your x-axis is your uh, hypothetical training load. So this is a nice um, just visual that Gavit had in one of his papers recently. Um, so here you have an inadequate, low, optimal, high, and excess excessive training load. So if we have a team that are training at an inadequate or a low training load, they're also going to have um, a low fitness, low injury rate, but overall they're going to have a low team performance as a result of both of those. If you have, on the other end of the scale, uh, a high training load or an excessive training load, you're going to be, your fitness is going to be quite high, but your injuries are also going to be uh, high. And uh, with, with those two combined, your team performance is going to suffer. So again, keeping those players on pitch is vital for team performance. So what we want to do is we want to be living in that optimal level, our optimal zones where our injuries are quite low. Our team fitness is high, and as and as a result of both of those, our team performance again hopefully is through the roof. So so again, that's why we want to we want to periodize, and that's why we we plan we plan out our years year cycles. So our philosophy then in integrating that into our system. So we have obviously we have these stats for GPS units, which give us back so much information. So we've actually banned straight line running from our club. Uh, we did the same in in the chiefs as well and um the reason behind that is that if we can measure what to do within rugby then why would we take um s and c time to get through those straight line running events um so i suppose it it it, it doesn't devalue the the need for an s and c but it puts more importance on the rugby and essentially if you're getting better at rugby by doing rugby and if you're getting fitter by doing rugby um you're going to be better prepared for the game on the weekend or, or for the game in a few weeks, whichever it is. The other part of philosophy is that, again, in traditional uh, rugby circles, anyways, I'm not 100% sure about other sports, um, or other team sports, but we'd, you'd look to typically get a really big preseason under the belt and then maintain all the way through to the finals if you get there. We believe in Kobe that maintenance is, is a slow death and it's one we want to avoid. So. I guess what we want to do is we want to continuously build and deload, build and deload. So we're continuously pushing that ceiling, that that threshold or the tolerance for training um, higher and higher each week. So so that's when we come to finals time at the end of the year, we're at our fittest that we'll ever be. And we're at um, our freshest as well. And again, in 2013, um, semi-final of the Super Rugby, we played against the Crusaders. Um, the final we played against the Brumbies, and it was interesting looking back at the data. Those were our two biggest weeks of the year. So it really just highlighted to me that if you have a real good structure, um, and if you're meticulous in your planning and, and, and your observations and your changes to, to plans throughout the year, uh, you could, it can work, and you can get the outcomes that, that you're after. So again, it's just a, a nice little story to sum up, uh, sum up what I'm talking about there. But we need some principles that are underpin our, our philosophy and underpin our planning. So what I spoken about earlier was just our, 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 our general adaptation syndrome. So essentially, we all know, we're all familiar with this, where we stress the body with a, um, a training and with, with, uh, with accurate and uh, uh, recovery, we get that adaptation and we can continually push that ceiling. So. We use this from a, a daily session to or a daily to a weekly kind of cycle. So we really um, promote that stress, um, recover, adapt cycle to our players. The second set of principles we use really are, again, a lot of you would be familiar with this, the acute to chronic workload ratio. Uh, we like to keep, we've, we've modified, I must say, we've modified our, our own um, in-house research and we've, we've modified our own acute to chronic ratio because it does have its limitations. but we work off of getting the guys into that sweet spot. Um, so uh, keeping them away from that injury risk danger zone and keeping them away from that uh, deconditioning zone uh, below that 0.8. So that we're continually, as I said, pushing that ceiling each week. The other principle that I've taken as well from the same paper um, by Gabbett is, um, if you look here on your, your y-axis, it's the likelihood of injury and your x-axis, your change in training load per week. You can see that with a zero, 0 to 5 or 0 to 10% change in training load, you're not actually increasing the likelihood of injury. So uh, you're safe in the fact that 
um, you can do you can have those increases. But if I just highlight that 10 to 15 percent change in training load, that's where you get uh, two to three times um, the likelihood of injury. So that's what we're looking to to avoid when we're programming those weeks and uh, those weekly loads in terms of the, the high metabolic load a team is going to do. Third principle is it's a really simple one, but it's been one of the most effective ones for us um, in the last few seasons. So we have our game as our first day of, of on feet, we'll say, um, of the week. So our game always starts the week. Um, typically, you'll have, the game, you'll have your day one to day five and a game at the end of the week. But there's a few reasons we've done this. And the first being that if you have your game, at the, the game at the end of the week, the game is an, an uncontrollable event. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen in that game. You don't know if it's going to be um, a high physical demand in terms of contact. You don't know if it's going to be a high-paced game. You don't know what. You don't know um, how much a player is going to play. Um, so we've taken that uncontrollable and we've put, we've put it to the very start of the week. So this allows us to make modifications to individuals uh, throughout the weeks um, as we can control the rest of their week. So if you've got a really high game in terms of um, movement demands, we can pull you back on that, that day one or day two. Um, likewise, if, if the team has a really low um, physical movement demands, we, uh, we can push them on that day one or day two. Uh, again, that has a bit of a, a caveat in that we will look at a, a lot of other um, factors and uh, a lot of other measures before we make those decisions, but it just makes it a lot easier for us to to, to plan our to, the, the rest of our week and to control those individuals throughout the rest of the week. The last principle for me then that underpins our philosophy is that you need to know your data and know your team. So for us, I guess this is kind of the boring part of it where you need to just have that constant and that reliable um, pool of data and it has to be... Um, yeah, I suppose you just have to collect and the more you collect, the more reliable it will be, the more valid it will be. So all we've done is we've we've collected that over the years and we have our um, high met weak intensity scale. And again, uh, through the help and the, the assistance of our, our sports science team, we've, we've developed um, our own uh, high met weak intensity scale where our max is essentially the max week we have done in terms of our high mets uh, and we've built in um, our, our our percentages and our labels in all the way down to our minimal week we'll do so we can again have that visual uh, and the numerical feedback uh, in terms of how we're going to build our year um, so it's just again it's just something that we use and something that we um, we apply to our, our macro cycle and our planning so those are our principles and, and what our foundations are behind our macro plan. So let's let's look at it a bit uh, a bit a bit deeper. So as you'll see, this um, this is round one on the x axis all the way to round nine. So uh, you'll see that there's a series of builds. We're building all the way up to round four. We're deloading the team, um, and we're building again, deloading, building. So it it ties in with the principles of of peaking for that final. Um, and continuously pushing that ceiling um, each week. So this is uh, just uh, the tabular version of it, and we're just looking at um, again the macro cycle reading from left to right, our days on feed. So what I mean by that is um, how many days that we're actually on feed. So uh, this is a four-day training. This is a, a, a five, so it'd be four plus a game, and then our turnaround. Um, our turnarounds would be. Um, when the game happened and when the next game will be. So a seven day would be a Saturday to a Saturday, an eight day would be a Saturday to a Sunday. Our high mid week intensity. So like I said earlier, uh, this is based off of our, what our 100% max would be. So this is 68% of a max week we'd be capable of. So it's a light week for us. Again, just notice the, the color coding we're using just for overall um, appreciation of, of, of the, the intensity. We also have our blocks. The philosophy behind our block, so this is a first uh, in-season building block. Um, and then our last thing we'll see here is our acute to chronic ratio. So do they sit in that sweet spot, that green, or are they in that deconditioning zone, that that um, that blue, or the, the danger zone pushing into that red? So just looking at another layer deeper again, 
we look at block one on its own, so from round one to round five, and as you can see, um, we're, we're following our principles. So we're, there's a 12% increase here from uh, round one to round two, um, and we're, we're under that 15% each week. We push the guys to a 90% week here, because again, we have that extra day of recovery um, on that, that eight day turnaround. So it's become an eight day, so it's a Saturday to a Sunday game. So we have an extra day of recovery. We can get a small bit more workload into the lads. and We can, again, continuously push that ceiling. And as you'll see, our acute to chronic ratio, we're in a happy, we're in a, we're in a good place there. We're hovering around that 1.3 and uh, above that 0.8. So we're in that sweet spot. Um, so we're quite happy with that. Second block then we'd look at is, it's a, it's a small bit different. So as you can see, even visually, you can see that there's a, there's a, there's a deload in the middle of the block. So compare that to the first block, which is a linear build, we're looking here at an undulating build. So we're building to deload to build again. So the reason that there's a, a deload in there is all because of that round robin seven. So it's a six day turnaround. So what that means again is that's us playing a game on a, a Saturday and the next game being on a, on a Friday. So we're losing one of those days recovery and um, we're losing a day on feet as well. So just because of the structure of the, of the week and structure of the, of the game cycle, we can't push the guys that, that day. We can't expect them to, to hit heights, to, to follow that linear progression that we'd, we'd like to. And again, <laughs> all plans, you're not, they're not going to be perfect. And you have to roll with the punches sometimes. And, and this is something that we cannot control. So we're happy enough to, to, to modify that and to plan for that. And I suppose just we'd be happy in the fact that we've got quite a good workload in under the lads um, prior to this week. We'd be happy in the fact that our acute to chronic is quite good. Now, I know we're breaking our principle here. We're jumping up to that 80%. But again, taking those two other factors into consideration, I suppose it's just something you can't avoid. And we, we're happy to do that. Uh, it would be just a, a chance for us to really look at our players and have a really individualised approach, which we do each week, but be really uh, conscious of that on that round robin eight in that second build. The last thing I want to just bring your attention to is the round robin five. So again, remember our game is at the start of the week, so we've got our game and then we're into uh, just essentially our down week. So this has to be given as much respect in terms of the planning and in terms of how you deliver to the players. Because if you don't have that very light week, and again, I go back to the Japanese culture, they don't want to take a day off. They don't want any time off. And they want to train all the time. So we need to have a really big focus here and an emphasis that this is actually a down week. We want you to mentally relax, physically relax. You'll get your two extra sessions, but they're going to be light sessions. You're going to have a, a, an acute to chronic ratio where you're dipping into that deconditioning zone. And the reason we want to do all that is that we want want to promote that recovery and promote the adaptation so that we can come into this uh, bye week here and we can hit the ground running and again just I'm harping on about it but we're, we're pushing that ceiling all the time each week if we don't recover properly if we don't adapt to the training stresses we won't be able to do that one consideration that I'd like to highlight is really our week layout so I'm going to give you just um We've seen our macro plan, I just want to touch on how we um, look at our weeks and just a consideration there. So this is pre-season 10 where we've got an 85% week. Again, that's the build-up and that's the make-up of, of the week. Um, and we've got a pre-season 7, so again, it's an 85% week, but it's only three days. So you've got a five-day, um, five, five training sessions versus three. So already, although your absolute value of 85% is quite high, uh, and it's the same in both. The concentration of that uh, intensity of that, that week is, is totally different. So you need to be aware of um, the overall value for the week and the, the, what you're trying to achieve. But you also need to be aware of what that looks in terms of the week structure. Um, so it's just, again, it's just a consideration for, for the practitioners out there just to be aware of. <laughs> okay, so we have our macro plan. We have our week plan set up. Um, how do we actually plan uh with our coaches so this is just an example again after a game on a Saturday we'll sit down with the coaches in the evening or, or or even Sunday morning we have coaches meetings and we'll explain what the upcoming week is looking like so 
okay, we'll say to them, it's a, it's a really hard week we're looking for. Uh, we're, looking, we're looking for around 85% of our max. The other thing we'll do is we'll break it down by, by the days. Um, again, we'll color code it so that the coaches have an idea of when they're going to go um, for those really hard sessions. And again, this doesn't change that often, but it's, it's a good reference point for our coaches. We also share this with our players and we break it down by their sub positions. Now, the importance of that is as well as to, um, to have the players primed for those big sessions and um, to again reiterate the importance of being physically and mentally fresh for those sessions and to, for them to be able to plan their week accordingly. So it's, it's a very important tool for the players to refer to as well. Um, and again on this, it's really important to note that this is all individualized as well. I know I'm showing you the, um, the overlay of the, the week itself, the day and the sub positions, but uh, we'll have our high metabolic loads um, for, for each of those. We'll also have them for the individual. So like I said, if uh, it comes game time and the front row, one of the members of the front row is quite low, We'll, we'll top them up and we'll add a small bit more on that Monday or, or that Tuesday. So this is highly individualized as well, um, which, which I'm not going to get into today, but it's just a, that broad overview. The session planning then really, um, we work in tandem again with the coaches. So again, as I said earlier, it has to be a fully integrated process. So it can't just be the coaches in their um, silo and, and you and yours. Like it has to be full integration. So. We just have a simple Google Drive uh, account where the coaches will have a session up the night before. Um, they'll input uh, most of it. We will look at um, putting in the high mets. So again, just to note that uh, I'm just going to talk through the color sequence here rather than actual values or, or the density of the drills, or, um, which we do live on the, um, with them. But again, just for um, simplicity, uh, simplicity's sake, uh, I'll just talk through, uh, through in, in terms of color. So as you can see, there's two instances here where we want to hit uh, the workload or, or game workload demands. So the mini team game and the three team turnover attack. So again, the coaches have that visual of where we want them to go really hard with the players um, and where to pull, pull back as well. Um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to be in a situation where the whole session is that sub-maximal effort, that yellow, that moderate intensity all the way through and, and ending up with the same, same high mets at the end. We want to really have those targeted pockets of high intensity. And if you think back to the, the, the earlier slide where I give you that A versus B, that A being the rugby specific, so it's again just a similar uh, uh, kind of intermittent, so it's that really high intensity uh, drop down to low and then high again versus um, that constant same pace, same intensity um, that we're looking to avoid. So again, it's just a visual for the coaches to be aware that where we need to target within the session. When we have our session um, completed or, or even during the session, we have a, a review, a plan and implementation um, process that we incorporate. So in the session itself, uh, we can actually impact uh, the, the, the coaches and uh, we can, uh, we can uh, provide a, a decent level of feedback. So I'm just going to show you a quick picture. So um, this is again, high metabolic load, so our, our fit average um, 673 and our day target 927. So that's a situation that we want to avoid and we do avoid. Um, so for our blocks, for our weeks to, um, to be right, our days have to be right, for our blocks to be right, our weeks have to be right. So we need to be able to hit our targets and hit our demands for each, um, each session that, that we go out and do so that our, our, our whole periodization um, plan works really. So how do we do that? Um, we incorporate um, our radio, so we are in constant feedback with the coaches throughout the session, uh, giving them updates on how their drill is going or if we need extras um, or, or those subtle changes with individuals within the drills. We also have um, iPads that we have um, with multiple iPads running, and multiple members of the SNC staff um, can provide instant feedback to the coaches and to the players and again, that visual feedback, just using those thresholds that, that sports allow you to do. Um, so, so that's another way we have that live feedback to the coaches to avoid the above scenario. 
The other thing then is we the coaches are really good in Kobe. They're they're really receptive and they've got again they have that growth mindset and want to want to continuously innovate and continuously um um buy into this this GPS system. So they often would have um a drill in the back pocket. Um, and they would, if, if we were quite low throughout the session, and if we didn't get the demands we were after in, in those, those red pockets of, of conditioning, we'd, um, we'd have a drill set up that we knew that we'd get uh, high conditioning levels out of that uh, work into the coach's technical and tactical, tactical um, aspect of what they need for the weekend. So they'll always have that, that almost that plan B. And then the, the last option then for us within a session is that top-up conditioning. We want to avoid having to do top-up conditioning at the end. So that's why we incorporate all these different aspects of, um, of feedback to the coaches within a session. But if we do need to top up, um, it'll typically be for just a couple of individuals. And again, relating back to our philosophy, it's going to be done through rugby. So if it's uh, passing waves or if it's, incorporating um, some some uh, rock work or some clean out work and that will be that'll be part of it so it'll be an SNC in conjunction with a, a coach or rugby coach taking that individual for the, his top ups at the end and again like I said it's all highly individualized um, and it's based off of the principles I spoke about earlier the session review and how we how we give feedback to the, to the coaches is again it's a it's a quite a simple process so this is what we planned and this is taken from the session plan that I showed you earlier and this is what actually happened so as you can see the warm-up the IPPs the individual performance plans we're quite happy with our mini team game obviously we didn't get um, up to those match demands or those mini team game demands that we were after in terms of high mitts so we need to talk to the coaches about that. So we'll sit down with them and we'll have a discussion about what we can do to change that mini team game and what might um, what might get some more high mets and what might change from a yellow to, to that red. So in this instance, the game was uh, in within the 40 meter all the way to the, to the try line. Um, the actual try lines that we used were um, the sidelines, so here and here. And we didn't get the desired effect. So what we did was just really simply we sat down with the coaches, can we change personnel? Can we change timings of drills? Can we change um, the rules? And we came with, we just came up with a small little fix where uh, the forwards must be within the five meter channel to score. So if you make a break and you score behind that yellow line, all your forwards in your team have to be within that yellow and red line to, for that score to count. So again, if you think about it from that um, high met point of view, you're going to increase the amount of accelerations to get in support um, to be in that red zone. You're going to uh, increase the amount of high speed running for the defenders chasing back, um, maybe blocking lines. So again, you're increasing the physical output here. And looking at that, the maps and the clarity, the coaches hit it. Uh, they were they, they nailed it. They hit that green session, but the actual high mets that we got from our free team turnover attack did not work. So again, just a bit of context in this drill. So what was happening was um, they were going through five phases and the coach could at any time or any stage throughout that um, double whistle and uh, drop the ball in behind the ruck so that the, the team who was defending um, it turns over into, into a counter attack. So what we just spoke about again with the coaches was Again, it's linking into their tactical and technical needs for, for the weekend. Um, adding in that, that kicking element, so kicks from nines, uh, tens, and varying the length of those kicks will, I suppose, it'll bring a huge line speed in the, in the chase. So again, you're getting those high mets, uh, and, and it would also bring that, that speed to get back and that urgency to get back in support of the receiver of the ball and the, of the kick. Um, so again, both teams high metabolic meters, um, accelerations, their high speed running was again increased by just a simple, simple little rule change in that. So everything else stayed the same. Coaches are happy with it from a, um, a tactical point of view. And that's what elicited the best physical response in the team as well. 
So we have the coaches on board and obviously the coaches uh, are really receptive. But I suppose the other major stakeholder of this whole process is are, are, are the players. And with the players we give, we have our own Kobe analysis tool where uh, we break down the, the metrics into, I suppose it's the most simplest form to view and to read. And the players can do this individually. So they can look at their own data against themselves. So again, that's buying into the, the self-determination theory that we dip in, dip in and out of throughout uh, the club and throughout different aspects of what we do. So essentially, they could see um, a day two session this week versus last week versus the week before. So are they progressing uh, as an individual? Um, so building that intrinsic motivation to improve uh, week on uh, week on week. Um, but we also, I suppose, we're not we're not that kind to them. We also have uh, them compared to the top performers in the team. So uh, again, all in terms of the high met, so they can look at who's the best in the team and how do I get there. And then from a, a sub level, um, I just blocked out the names here. That's the oranges. Just from a so, uh, another level deeper, they can look at who in their position has the highest amount of high mets and how, how am I going to get there? So again, if I'm a front rower and I'm working at 600 high mets, I know the best in my position is 616. So what I need to do to, to chase him down, I'm nearly there. But, but um, yeah, you have to be always eyeing that who's at number one and taking that number one spot. So essentially you want the players to be thinking that uh, we don't want to give any doubt that they're physically ready for a game. Um, and you want to be able to take that jersey off of, off of whoever's in front of you. And give no no uh, no reasons to to leave you out, and giving the coaches no reasons to leave you out the weekend. So yeah, we have a two pronged attack there. So intrinsic and, and I suppose that 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 team that within the team motivation as well. We also I suppose one of the main things that works for me, and it's just has been highlighted in, and in the other presentations that that have gone on, uh, just that one on one that team meeting where you sit down and you get to know the player and know what makes him tick. Um, know how to really influence them so um they're they're just really important parts of the whole process where you just get to know your players and your staff i suppose and be able to be able to influence them at, at a greater level and i guess building that emotional connection and it will again buy give, give greater buy into what you're trying to do from a, a physical standpoint as well um, and as i've said throughout the presentation that you need to relate to players and coaches wherever possible. So it has to be um, using their language. It has to be, uh, again, uh, relating to what they see out the pitch. And for me, one of the most simple and easiest ways to do this is uh, just use video. Um, show them what they've done and what they're, what, they're, uh, what they're not doing. So again, I'm just show, gonna show you a clip where we've got three teams. You've got a pink team at the bottom, You've got the coaches in red, uh, blue team here, and a yellow team, which are kind of hard to see at the very top. So <clears throat> this is part of a, a session I did with the defensive coach, where we're looking to just change the mindset of the player. Um, so by using that, that analogy of that, that high met, so that early work, that early acceleration, uh, and the impact it has on our defensive structure. So... What you'll see is the ball will be dropped by the yellow and the coaches will kick another ball to the pink. So there's that ball, pink gathers. And you've got three players highlighted from that blue team. And the reason they're highlighted is they didn't accelerate hard. They didn't achieve those high mets really early. And they've left uh, holes in their defense. So that defense isn't structurally sound and it gives an opportunity for the pink to, to attack. Again, small bit of... Oh. Apologies. More of a good footwork, <laughs> poor decision by Blue, <clears throat> and uh, we end up with a with a try for the pink. So <clears throat> we'll just watch that again. So again, as a result of not working hard early and not achieving those high met meters, uh, we've ended up in a position where we've 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 uh, conceded a score. On the other hand, again the blue team, they all accelerate here. They all accelerate hard. They get up in the faces of the yellow team uh, structurally or our defense is, is sound uh, it's ready it's primed to move off the line cuts down any options by doing that 
and meets them behind the gain line. So again, it's just that difference and a change in mindset of the players where they can work really hard, get that high mid early, and it actually makes the defensive effort a lot easier to control and, and you, 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 you're in control of that situation by the end of it. And then the last thing I just want to talk about is the motivation within the squad and how we use the GPS to, to motivate our, our players and our, um, specifically. So a quote I've taken directly from Lancaster in one of his presentations last year, so that's short Lancaster, is uh, we rise or fall to our level of, of our training. So again, it ties in with our philosophy. If we're not training at those really high elite levels that we want to be, we're not pushing that ceiling on and on um, like our philosophy intends us to do. So we're not peaking again for the finals. So we need to be able to um, reach new heights and, and push on our levels of our um, levels of our training each week. So again, I'm taking from the from the, um, the example that the the, the the session plan that I showed you earlier. So this is a mini team game, um, and it's going to be a ten minutes, uh, ten minute long. So we're going to have four minutes of a game, a two minute half time, and another four minutes. So it's going to be split into two halves. And then just in coaching points, uh, we from the SNC point of view will write in that we are looking for a, a half time team updates from the SNC team. So that team update will be either live on the iPads or be on the big screen that the, that the players will be able to see. And through us being, uh, having that live data and the live feedback to the players, we can highlight uh, what players are, are low, uh, what players are high. And I guess it's that motivation and it's almost that fear that you don't want to be last in the group. You don't want to be um, called out in front of your peers, in front of the coaches, in front of um, other staff. And it's it's almost making the guys uncomfortable and, and needing them to and pushing them to to be in that red zone of, of training uh, for that drill. So it creates a huge competition. So we can do that on on an individual basis on the iPads, and we also have them set up for um, the teams. Again, the coaches are really good. They'll have the teams um, set up prior to to going out, so we can have all that pre pre uh, planned into the iPad. So again, we just give them who's high, who's low, and we expect to see um, a surge in in, uh, in uh, physical output for the for the second half. Or else, if we're training at a good level, we can we can we can tell them that as well. So again, just to finish on the last story here uh, in terms of how we use it is this is a again that same example where we've got a conditioning game. Um, it's a four minutes worth of a conditioning game. We have our half time where we came in and we said to the guys, "Look at what you're what you're showing us out here is it's not good enough for for our standard of uh, for our physical conditioning, and we need to see an increase in um, in output across the board. We need to see those high mets. So again, giving them that visual, we need to see that acceleration, that really explosive acceleration, that really explosive um, that high speed running or those decelerations. So we have to see that. We need to see more of it." So again, what we saw was a huge increase across the board. Um, the coaches, uh, even their response subjectively, it was just, it was just unbelievable. It was, uh, it was a, an outstanding uh, second half. So duration, as you can see, it stayed the same. The high mets, there was a significant increase in the high mets output, and then there was the distance didn't really um, change that much on average. So for us objectively then we can go back to the coaches and say this is what happened it was just a huge increase in high mats so again that's, that's just a, a live uh, yeah representation of what happened i suppose that is really important to be able to uh, to do that but it kind of um brings us to the question like well, why why weren't we training at that level um prior to this um and I suppose it just highlights the importance of having motivation in your within your drills or an aspect of motivation within your drills. If you're constantly training at that uh, that yellow level, like I've said, that moderate level, you're not going to be um, pushing that ceiling of the players. You're not going to demand too much from them physically. And what they have adapted to, they, they'll almost they'll slip into that deconditioning zone quite quickly. So you have to have an element of motivation and uh, whether that's GPS, whether that's coach, um, verbal or visual feedback, um, I, I, yeah, whatever, whatever suits your team best, um, you need to figure out. But I suppose it's just a really important part of it that you need to be working at um, with a fully motivated squad and you probably have to have 
um, tools and uh, implement some strategies to, to, to drive that motivation for the certain aspects of, of the training. Okay, um, thanks a lot for your time. And I suppose the key points for me again are when you're using GPS, such a complex system, try keep it as simple as possible. How do you do that? I suppose you need to know, you need to really be a master of your craft. You need to have a really good understanding of what GPS is and, and how it relates to your specific sport, how your coaches want that data represented and presented to the players and how you're going to get best buy in. So yeah, it's, it is, uh, it is, the idea is to keep it simple, but it is a, a, an extremely complex, complex um, issue. Uh, GPS has to coexist with the rugby program. Um, was the main thing is just don't be that numbers guy on the side who uh, is throwing out a bit of research and um, a few dashboards and, and nothing that makes sense to the players or to the coaches. It has to you have to speak their language. It has to make sense to them, and it has to be applicable to, to how you want to play the game. Uh, and also, I suppose that, that that KPI it has to it has to be a measurement of, of exactly that. The use of video and live feedback are really effective motivational tools and uh, I'd recommend that if you do select those pockets of, of, of high intensity or high density in your, in your training, that, that you have some sort of a motiv motivational tool implemented. And again, from a feedback point of view, um, a review point of view, um, that's, that's where you're going to get growth in your, in your planning and growth in your program and even growth in your coaches. So, uh, if they're open to that feedback from a physical standpoint and what they possibly could do from uh, changing the, the drill structure and, and the elements of the drill, then you should be given that feedback and you should have a, a system, a systematic approach to doing that. The last thing I want to touch on is just don't underestimate the importance of a working relationship. So without that working relationship and without you having that connection with the player, with the group, um, with the coaches, um, you won't be able to to grow your your own philosophy or grow your your own system. So, and that's that's just man hours. That's just sitting down with the players one on ones. That's just sitting down with the coaches as a group, uh, putting time into learning the sport. So uh, whether it's doing a, a rugby course and just learning about rugby, how you can apply your your knowledge from the S and C and bridge that gap from the S and C sport science to the rugby. Um, cohort I suppose that's that's what's really really important and just don't underestimate how important that working relationship is um, I'd just like to thank you again for your time it's been a, a really interesting webinar and really long um, sorry um, uh, it's been it's, I, I've kind of gone a small bit over time but um, I thank you for your 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 patience and, and, and the time you've given me to speak today uh, if you want to get in contact with me again uh, you're available on LinkedIn or, or through the stats sports lads if you, if, you, if you can thank you cheers for that own thanks a million um plenty of detail in there um and and with that detail then as well a, a lot of the the rationale for for why you're doing um what it is you're doing so so thanks for that um just very very quickly we have one or two questions um from the audience so um i'm just going to so the first one i have here um, is just about the the week to week um, schedule and where where do you guys fit in um, your your one to one meetings um, and your your team meetings? Um, well, after the game, obviously we're we're going to have a review on a Monday, um, but we'll also I suppose we won't be able to fit in meetings with everyone, so it's almost those high risk guys. So. Uh, from a coaching point of view, we'll sit down on a on a Sunday and speak about everyone. Um, but we'll also wait until we have those other markers, so their um, psychometrics, um, that discussion with the player before we make a decision um, on, on if they train or not. In terms of giving feedback about how they're performing from a physical standpoint in the rugby, um, I guess those meetings can happen in any kind of capacity, really. It can happen... Um, on the fly where you see something in training, you notice and you, you bring it to their attention after the session. Um, and I suppose we also have those one-on-one -on -one blocks and um, scheduled throughout the, throughout the week where players can meet rugby coaches, but we've extended it out to S&C staff as well, where they can have that sit down with the coaches or with the S&Cs. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and then the last one is actually quite an interesting one is, uh, 
if you had, if you could give yourself one piece of advice, I suppose, to, to your former self working maybe with the Chiefs or something like that, that, that you now know um, from your experience, what would, what would that be? That's a good question, yeah. Um, I think it just goes back to my, just my, my, my key points there. And um, the first one, again, in terms of keeping it simple, to be able to do that, you have to really have a good appreciation and understanding of the GPS system. Uh, to be able to do that, you have to put time into uh, reading the, the research that's the, that the guys are doing and um, how it applies to your team, collecting the data in a robust manner. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the take home for that, that question is uh, you just have to have to be real, uh, really know your craft uh, and and be able to make it simple for everyone else around you. Okay, good answer. Um, Owen, thanks a million for that, and and thanks for for putting the time and and all the detail into that presentation and and, yeah. and being open enough to to share what you're doing with us. Yeah, appreciate um, it. Okay.